Okay, who's excited to learn a little bit about some agriculture? I know I am. A little livestock, a little crops, a little farming, a little ranching. Uh, this is key issue one for chapter 10. Uh, this is our agriculture unit. Essentially, key issue one is just going to explain a little bit about the origins of agriculture and then kind of the beginnings of subsistence versus commercial agriculture. So we probably already know a little bit what agriculture is in our head, but keep in mind there is an actual definition for it. Uh, essentially it's the cultivation of plants and what they mean by rearing of animals is essentially um, domesticating animals, either for to helping you with the farm or to actually eat the animals. Uh, this has to be done of one of two ways, either for subsistence, which is going to be to keep your family fed uh, or some of the locals, and then economic gain simply means you are looking to sell everything you grow for money and then you are going to use your money elsewhere. One simple side note is keep in mind when cultivation or to cultivate means to care for. So when you cultivate the land, it means you are carrying the land, you are digging up, you are planting the crops, etc. To the agricultural revolution, uh, for the most part, humans hunted and gathered uh, was pretty stereotypical where you had men for the most part going out uh, hunting live animals. Women would stay around the local area and gather up um, fruits, vegetables, whatever they could find. Uh, usually, for the most part, um, they stayed in really small groups, usually 50 or less. The reason for this was if it was a little too big, then you would have a lot more people competing. And usually they were isolated from one another. Uh, keep in mind, since the seasons change, animals change patterns, these people had to frequently move from one place to another based on where the animals were going. So they were not stationary, they had to continue moving where plants were in season or where animals were migrating for that season. You think these hunters and gatherers were actually really, really old people? They don't do this anymore? Well. Um, we do still have people in the world that do hunt and gather today. They don't use modern agriculture practices. Uh, these are usually people in isolated parts of the world, furthest from society, furthest from agriculture farms, ranching, etc. Uh, one perfect example, our textbook even mentions here, the Bushmen from Nambia and Botswana. Uh, to this day, they continue, even though you have a cameraman there showing you um, kind of that people can get to these civilizations, they do still practice traditional hunting and gathering to this day. So the agricultural revolution is essentially when humans started to domesticate plants and animals. Um, animals for a time being, again, was they used them in the, in the fields to actually work for them. Later on, they started using them for meat, milk, etc. Um, but basically, before this, they would have to move around through the entire part of the, their location just to simply get all their daily needs. Now, with the agricultural revolution, uh, they're going to be able to kind of stay in one spot, be able to farm, be able to uh, make basically all their daily needs from their backyard. Uh, keep in mind there are going to be three different agricultural revolutions. Um, when somebody just says the agricultural revolution, they're referring to this one. This is going to be the first agricultural revolution. One of our questions for the agricultural revolution is simply going to be the why. Oh, sorry there. Um, why was there an agricultural revolution? For one, there was environmental factors at play. This was near the end of the ice ice age, uh, humans now had to expand the ecumene, which is simply, again, where humans can inhabit the earth or where they are inhabiting the earth. Um, since you have the ice receding, you now have more options to move around to different places, and you have more land to actually be able to start uh, to see growth or to actually find berries that have seeds and learn kind of the agricultural pro process of planting um, seeds. The second part is more cultural. Um, they wanted to stop moving around around, around just to simply stay in one place. I consider this the lazy factor where humans just wanted to stand still. They wanted to have a backyard. They wanted to be able to not move around all the time. They wanted to have a permanent shelter. Keep in mind, if you're moving from place to place before, you do not have a permanent shelter. The cultural factors, there's still a debate between is this experimentation where these humans decided, um, yeah, we're just going to try to see if these seeds are actually working when we put them in the ground, when it rains, um, things come up, or was this by accident? They kept hunting and gathering, they got all these seeds and they kept dropping them, and then they stumbled upon, hey, this is how things are growing, or we can just grow stuff here if we keep stepping on all of our berries, etc. It's a big debate in kind of the uh, history community of what actually occurred. Now again, there's going to be three agricultural revolutions. I simply went over the first one with you. The second one, uh, this is not in the beginning of our reading, so if you want to take notes on this, I would. Uh, the second agricultural revolution coincides with the Industrial Revolution. Remember, again, this is like stage two of the demographic transition model where uh, what are today developed countries start engaging in. So now you have all these new inventions, um, steel plows. This allows for 
much faster um, agricultural practices. Thus, you can start to have much larger farm sizes, which we'll get to here in a little bit. The third agricultural revolution is going to be in, in the 1900s, the mid-1900s, the mid-20th century, where you start having kind of cross-breeding of different plants. Um, this allows uh, for farmers to see this new technology. It brings up more yields. Yields is going to be how much crops you can grow in a certain area. Um, bioengineering greatly, greatly, greatly reduces labor demand throughout the world. One of the other names for this third agricultural revolution is going to be, quote, the Green Revolution. Um, and it's going to take place, for the most part, in developed countries throughout the world. All right, so for the agriculture hearse around the world, you want to keep a few of these in mind, some of the big ones here. Um, going from left to right or west to east, you got Latin America, you got Southwest Asia, Sub Saharan Africa, East Asia, and then Southeast Asia are going to be the major hearse that we want to know um, and kind of how they spread and where they spread to. Um, Latin America should be pretty easy. Keep in mind, think Mexico, think Central America, and then obviously it's going to move south and it's going to move north as well. Um, keep in mind the Middle East. A lot of the things, including language, is going to start roughly around here and then slowly move to Europe. Sub-Saharan Africa is a little bit trickier. Keep in mind, not much agriculture in the Sahara Desert region, so it's going to spread west and it's also going to start to spread south um, here as well. Um, the highland area of China here, you're going to have a big hearth, going to go north and then south as well. Uh, so you just want to have these in your general um, mental map of where these kind of hearths began. For each one of these hearths, you kind of want to have an idea of what they're kind of known for, or at least the early crops. Uh, keep in mind this has changed throughout the years, mainly because of the diffusion of a lot of these crops. So this is not where they're only at today, this is where their origins were. Sub-Saharan Africa, keep in mind Southern Africa, we have some yams, millet, rice. Um, again, we're going to also have rice in the South West Asia, or excuse me, sorry, um, the East Asian part as well. Uh, so East Asia brings us rice, millet. Rice is going to be grown in kind of a watery, wet area. Uh, you should geographically be thinking about uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia uh, for how wet it gets there. Um, other hearths are going to be again Latin America, beans, cotton, potato, and most importantly, maize slash corn. You need to understand maize is the same thing as corn. In some readings and some questions, you might just see maize and not corn. They like to flip-flop these words uh, just to see if you actually know what you're talking about there. Uh, then our final one is going to be Southwest Asia. Again, this is the Middle East. Uh, this is going to be kind of the root of a lot of these hearths, one of the older ones. Barley, wheat, lentils, and olives. Now we got some crops growing. We need to start domesticating some animals. Uh, so roughly 8,000 years ago, we started having our cows, our goats, our sheep, our pigs. Um, basically, again, keep in mind you want to remember that essentially we use these animals at first to kind of help us around the farm area, and then later on we start using them for milk, using their fur, and then finally deciding to um, eat the animals. Um, of course, we didn't eat the dogs, but dogs were previously domesticated a little bit earlier before the agricultural revolution. The idea behind this is this is probably because of uh, wolves that would get close to humans. Finally, one or two would get friendly. Um, therefore, they would kind of use them for security or hunting. It's kind of kind of how dogs kind of made their bond. So dogs, again, predate the agricultural revolution when we talk about domestication. Um, our other one here is going to be horses. Uh, this one is one you really want to kind of associate with that whole Indo-European hypothesis of how did that family, language family, get to Europe. Um, this kind of lends itself to that kind of belief. Horses were domesticated in Central Asia. Think about Kazakhstan region. region. And then their diffusion actually follows that diffusion of the Indo-European language which again le leads credence to kind of that warrior hypothesis um, of the Kurgans kind of invading or heading towards uh, Europe. You guys have all been waiting for the subsistence versus commercial agriculture. This is going to be very, very, very critical um, to the agriculture unit. We need to know this inside and out. You need to understand these solid generalizations between subsistence and commercial agriculture. So the, for the first one, subsistence again is simply people are producing this food for their family. They're growing it, they're eating it. They're growing it, they're eating it for their local family or extended family around them. Gen keep a good generalization that usually these are small scale, they're not going to be very big, and they're more local, and they're in the developing world. So you're not going to see a lot of this in the United States, Canada. You want to think more Africa. You also want to think, again, more uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, etc. Uh, commercial, agricult <coughs> excuse me, commercial agriculture, on the other hand, 
Uh, they produce the food simply to sell, either to another company, um, other families, other people, but generally to big food companies as we're kind of seeing in Food Inc. Uh, they're usually a large scale, which means they're going to be much, much bigger um, that is a subsistence type farm. They use a lot of technology, whereas subsistence is going to use a lot of hand tools. And again, this is commercial agriculture, so they're looking to sell it. So if you ever get these confused, think about commercial. What's a commercial try to do? It's a, it tries to sell you stuff. Uh, this is going to be pretty common in the United States. The United States probably has um, the most disproportionate amount of farmers compared to how much farmland we actually do have. We do not really use much farmers here in the United States. So uh, there are plenty of different characteristics that are separating subsistence from commercial agriculture. Uh, again, one of the good general rules is you got a lot of machinery for commercial agriculture, big farms, and then you have a lot of hand tools, smaller farms, a lot of families are working for it. These commercial ones, you're not going to have as many farmers per se, whereas in the developing world, a lot of the people simply work in agriculture one form or another. Um, the labor force, again, 44% of the labor force in the developing world are in agriculture or they work in some sort of food industry. Um, in the United States, uh, we're at about 2% and in the rest of the developed world, we're at about 5% of our population uh, works in agriculture in one way or another. Um, again, 2% of the labor force in the United States and Canada. Uh, we don't just grow stuff for people in the United States. We grow a lot of food for everybody in the world. So we essentially have a surplus here in the United States. So the United States, the reason we have a lot of big farms, we're not just selling to Americans and Canadians. We're selling all over the world. Uh, here are some good generalizations you want to know. Farmers and labor force. Again, a lot of the developing world, sub-Saharan Africa, okay, Middle East, South Asia, and then you also have East and um, Southeast Asia as well. So these are good generalizations you want to know. Farmers in the labor force, the more farmers you have, it means more likely that subsistence farming. The less farmers you have, the more likely that is commercial or big production farming. All right, so a big difference that we want to know uh, between um, commercial and subsistence farming is farm size. Commercial farms are far bigger. Um, if you look here just on average the United States, we have 161 heck acres here and in China we you, they get one uh, so that's just on average size of a farm um, again for these big farms you have to use a lot of machinery um, subsistence again a lot of hand tools this is why we are able to um, kind of compete at the national or the international scale uh, with agriculture again use of machinery actually I made a little typo here let me fix this here uh, let's see here all right all right, all good. Actually, we're not. Now we have caps here. All right, now we're going here. All right, so use of machinery is the big thing between commercial and subsistence. Uh, you have a lot of big tractors. You have a lot of technology, including GPS. Um, even when you talk about a specialized bio um, engineering of plants, GMO type stuff, um, commercial farms usually take advantage of that. Uh, for the most part, subsistence is a lot of manual labor. You have a lot more people out there because you need a lot more people to actually get this work done. Um, <clears throat> a good graphic to know and understand is the farmland per tractor map that was in your guys' reading. Basically, they're showing you, um, do you have a lot of tractors per farmland that you do have? Obviously, in the United States, we do have a lot. Same thing for South America and Europe. We're using a lot of technology to do our farming, whereas when you go to Sub-Saharan Africa and you head out to East Asia um, and Indonesia, Malaysia area, you're not going to have as much technology out there or industry doing this farming for you.